Hey everyone, welcome to X Bundy Diaries. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, and today I'll be discussing the Christian romance novel Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. This video is another installment of the ongoing series X Bundy Library, where I share my thoughts on the harmful Christian books I read growing up. The reason I've chosen to talk about Redeeming Love now in particular is because it's being adapted into a movie. And not like a small, straight-to-DVD type of movie, but an actual mainstream production. It is over two hours long, and it will be in theaters this Friday, January 21st, 2022. The release of this movie is very discouraging to me. The book is dearly beloved in many Christian circles, and the movie is just giving it the opportunity to be even more widely publicized. I will put a link to the trailer below so that you can watch the whole thing yourself, but I want to read a couple of the top comments to you. This one says, This book literally changed my life, and I have never felt the love of Jesus portrayed so strongly before in one story. This trailer has all those same emotions coming back, and I am so excited to see it opening day and probably two more times in theater. I can't stop crying every time I watch this trailer. Another one says, I've been dreaming of this book becoming a movie for over 15 years. I first read it in high school and it's my favorite book. I'm so happy. I hope they stay true to the book with a crying emoji and a heart. And here's one by someone who just read it for the first time. Just finished the book and while it does cover mature content, it is eloquently done and describes a redeeming love so much bigger than between man and woman but describes the sacrificial, patient, forgiving love of God for his children. Hoping this movie will remember to focus on that love. And that love is what this book is ultimately supposed to be about. God's love for those who choose to follow him, Christ's love for his church. But the love that this book portrays is not love at all. It's abusive, violent, controlling, and deeply psychologically damaging. And for women and anyone else who is shoved into that category incorrectly by transphobia and the gender binary and purity culture, it's a double whammy because it's two layers of an abusive portrayal of love, God's abusive love for you and a man's abusive love for you. The message I received as a teenage girl reading this book is that I was a worthless piece of shit without the redeeming love of two men, Jesus and my future husband. I was first introduced to redeeming love by my mom. It was her favorite book when I was growing up and she finally allowed me to read it when I was 16. I loved the book at the time and I would go on to read almost every single Christian romance novel that Francine Rivers wrote. And I would proudly tell people that Francine Rivers was my second favorite author after my first favorite author, God, who wrote the Bible. Technically speaking, I still think Francine Rivers is a good writer. I could enjoy her style if it were not for the absolute garbage messages that she is propagating. And oh, is she propagating. Going back to read this book for the first time in 10 years, I was expecting it to be bad but I was not prepared for how bad it really is. That being said, these are the messages that are deeply embedded in my psyche from an ongoing 23 year indoctrination. So it really fucked with me reading it again in the present. It conjured a very strong sense of 16 year old me and how she saw herself and her purpose in the world. It also reminded me of how brainwashed I still am in some ways. I've been deconstructing for seven years and I've been an agnostic atheist for three. But even though my intellectual self rejects this shit with my entire being, my emotional self is still traumatized and believes it sometimes. Simply walking away from Christian fundamentalism is not enough to change my brain. I am still deprogramming from all of those harmful messages that were all around me, that I was hearing all the time, and that I ultimately believed and accepted. So as you're listening to my critiques of this book, if you feel like I missed something or I didn't go hard enough against something in the book, please feel free to point it out in the comments. 
Also, I made it through half of the book, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Please let me know if you'd like me to read and talk about the rest of the book. If there's enough interest, I'll make a part two, and if not, I'll just move on to another topic. Okay, lots of content warnings for this video. I wrote them down so that I wouldn't forget any. Domestic violence, violence in general, misogyny and sexism, lots of it. Verbal, emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. Kidnapping and Stockholm Syndrome. There could be more than that, but those are kind of the main ones that I noticed. It is a very abuse-heavy book, and Rivers is very explicit in her descriptions. There is also homophobia, racism, ableism, and fat phobia, rape, and sexual assault, kind of sprinkled throughout the book. I won't be pointing out those specific parts, but I just needed you to know that they're there. I also feel like it's important to point out that this entire story is a very white perspective. Obviously, every book written by a white person is going to be a white perspective, but I think it's extra important to be aware of that with this book for a couple of reasons. First, this is a historical novel. It takes place in California during the gold rush, and the white settlers are portrayed as righteous and worthy in their theft of land and resources. The indigenous people that they are stealing from are rarely mentioned, and when they are, it's in a very racist way. There's also one Asian American character in Redeeming Love named Mai Ling. In the trailer of the Redeeming Love movie, you can see the character Mai Ling, and it appears that they have expanded her character and given her speaking lines. In the book, not only does she have no speaking lines, but the way that the white characters speak about her is fetishizing and dehumanizing, and she is mentioned in relation to A Toy. Doing some research into this, I discovered that A Toy was a real woman of the gold rush. She was the second Chinese woman to immigrate to California, and she was the first Chinese American sex worker and madam in California. I will put a link down below to a video I found that talks about A Toy's fascinating and complicated story. The creator of the video also shares the history of anti-Chinese racism in California and the fetishization of Asian women that continues into the present day. I am glad to have found out about Ah Toy because I had never heard of her before, but I don't think it was appropriate for Francine Rivers to talk about her in the book, especially in the careless way that she did. Honestly. I don't think it was appropriate for Rivers to write about human trafficking or sex work at all. She is a privileged white lady from the suburbs, and as far as I know, she has no personal experience to speak from. On top of that, I don't think she has treated these topics with the care, consideration, and nuance that they deserve. Another link I want to share below is a website that talks about decriminalizing sex work, and how this not only helps adult, consensual sex workers have rights and protections, but it ultimately helps end human trafficking. That is definitely not a perspective that is shared in evangelical Christianity. The second reason I think it's extra important to remember the white perspective of this book is because of the extreme purity culture focus. Purity is a stand-in for whiteness, and Rivers reminds us over and over again that the main character is white. There are multiple descriptions throughout the book of her long golden hair, her blue eyes, and her porcelain complexion. One of the names used for her is Angel, and her beauty is seen as angelic and the epitome of desire. These are white-centric beauty standards, and they exclude women of color, especially black women. So the messages that this book sends to young, impressionable girls about desirability and beauty are going to be different based on race. There is so much more to be said about this, but being white, I don't think I'm the right person to say it. I would recommend checking out the Sluts, Sinners, and Saints podcast by two friends, Roxy and Ivory. They have an awesome episode talking about their experiences with purity culture as black women and they talk about purity culture in most of their episodes. 
including their recent critique of Girl Defined. I'll put links to those episodes down below so that you can check them out. Redeeming Love is based off of the story in the Old Testament of the prophet Hosea and his wife Gomer. Hosea 1-2 says, The Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. And so he does. And then Gomer goes back to her previous profession of prostitution. And then God tells him to go get her, basically. In preparation for this video, I reread the entire book of Hosea on my phone. This was the first time in about four years that I had read more than a verse or two from the Bible all at once. And let me tell you, I did not enjoy it. The whole time I was like, what is the point of this? Why is God being such an asshole? I don't like the story of Hosea and Gomer, and I don't think it should have been made into a book. Certainly not a book that, again, impressionable teens and young adults will read and apply to their sense of self, their romantic relationships, and their relationship with God. But it was made into a book, a very popular one, and now it's a movie. So let's talk about it. The two main characters are Michael Hosea, who represents Hosea, and Sarah, aka Angel, who represents Gomer. Michael Hosea is a 26-year-old Christian farmer who has been saving himself for marriage and asking God to bring him a wife. Angel is a very traumatized sex worker who was trafficked as a young child and who has been abused and exploited her entire life and she's only 18. The story begins with Michael being in town to sell vegetables from his farm, and he sees Angel walk by and thinks she's very beautiful, and God says to him, she's the one. Michael Hosea was unloading crates of vegetables from the back of his buckboard when he saw a beautiful young woman walking along the street. She was dressed in black like a widow and a big rough looking man with a gun on his hip was at her side. All along Main Street, men stopped what they were doing, took off their hats and watched her. She said not a word to anyone. Michael couldn't take his eyes off her. His heart beat faster and faster as she came near. He willed her to look at him, but she didn't. He let out his breath after she passed him, not even aware that he had been holding it. This one, beloved, Michael felt a rush of adrenaline mingled with joy. Lord, Lord. Now I need to show you a close up of this because every time God speaks to one of the characters in this book, it is bolded and italicized. But then also there is the voice of Satan and the voice of Satan is bolded, but not italicized. So that's how you can tell the difference between God's voice and Satan's voice in the character's head. So just keep that in mind. So Michael asks the shopkeeper who Angel is and learns that she's a sex worker. And this is the lovely thing he has to say about it. She's a soiled dove? A girl like that? He didn't want to believe it. She's not just any soiled dove, Michael. Angel is something real fine from what I hear. Special training. But I can't afford to find out for myself. Michael needed some air. He went back outside. Unable to help himself, he glanced down the street again at the slender girl in black. She was coming back down the other side of the street and went right past him again. His reaction was worse this time, harder to take. On the next page, we get our first description of how Michael is not like other boys. <laughs> Michael Hosea was a quiet man, but there wasn't anything soft about him. There was something in his look that made men treat him with respect. It wasn't just his height or the strength of his body, which were both impressive enough. It was the clear steadiness of his gaze. He knew what he was about, even if the rest of the world didn't. <laughs> Michael is described over and over again as this almost godlike man. And the reason for that, I think, besides patriarchy, which is obvious, is that this whole story is supposed to represent God and his children, Christ and the church, 
Michael, even though he's a human character, is supposed to represent God. So it's like this weird mix of, you know, he's weak because of his sexual desire, but he's also described in like this almost perfect way that he's like so different from the other men around him. He couldn't get his mind off her. Not all the rest of that day. Back down out of the mother load to his valley. He kept seeing her walk up that muddy street. Angel, he said, trying her name on his tongue. Just testing. And he knew, even as he said it, his waiting was over. Lord, he said heavily, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. But he knew he was going to marry that girl anyway. So in the next chapter, Michael decides to pay to see Angel. But instead of taking advantage of her services that he's paying for, he just wants to talk. And the purpose is to convince her to marry him. Despite his 26 years, Michael felt like a callow youth standing outside Angel's open door in the dim lantern light of the brothel hallway. He could scarcely breathe. His heart was racing so fast. She was even more beautiful than he remembered and smaller. Michael watched her cross the room to a washstand. Angel, the name fit the way she looked. A flawless, blue-eyed porcelain doll with pale skin and golden hair. Maybe marble was a better description. Porcelain shatters. She looked too hard for that. So hard, he hurt looking at her. Why? He hadn't expected to feel that. He had worried too much about getting past the desire he knew she would arouse in him. God, give me strength to resist her temptation. Are you sure you want to talk? I'm sure. He looked dead certain. With a sigh, she turned to dry her hands. Whatever you want, mister. She sat on the bed and crossed her legs. Michael knew what she was doing. He fought the swift desire to take her up on the clear message she kept sending him. The longer he stood silent, the more his mind drew images, and she knew it by the look in her eyes. Was she mocking him? No doubt about that. He really hates her right from the beginning, in my opinion, because of what her body stirs up in his body, and he blames her for that. He got the chair from the corner, set it in front of her, and sat down. Her satin wrap had opened a little. He knew she was toying with him. She swung her foot idly, like a pendulum, 60 seconds to a minute, 30 minutes to a half hour, all the time he had. Lord, I'd need a million years to reach this woman. Are you sure this is the one you meant for me? You said you wanted to talk, mister, so talk. Why the name Angel? Because of how you look? Or is that your real name? Call me whatever you want, mister. It doesn't matter. He studied her. I think Mara suits you. Someone you knew back home? No, it means bitter. She looked at him then and went very still. What game was this? Is that what you think? She lifted one shoulder indolently. Well, I suppose Mara is as good a name as any. She began to swing her foot back and forth again, ticking off the time. How long had he been here? How long did she have to put up with him? He literally picks a name that means bitter and calls her that. <laughs> it goes beyond saying, I think you're bitter. He literally labels her that and he has known her, what, like less than an hour? That is so proud and self-righteous and I just hate it so, so much. Michael saw he had made a fine mess of this first meeting. Yeah, you think? What had he expected? To come in here, talk plain, and walk out with her on his arm? She looked like she wanted to give him the boot. He was angry at himself for being such a naive fool. You're not talking love, Mara, and I didn't come here to use you. But that's actually not true. He didn't come to use her for sex, but he definitely came to use her for his desire of having a godly wife and you will see him pressure her, shame her, and eventually, spoiler alert, kidnap her. So 
It's just a different kind of using. It's the kind that is acceptable by Christian patriarchy. Oh boy, okay, I'm getting a little riled up already. <laughs> I've gotta whew, calm it down a little bit. <sighs> Michael came up behind her and put his hands on her shoulders. He felt her tense at his touch. Come home with me, he said softly. Be my wife. Angel shrugged his hands off angrily and moved away from him. No thanks. Why not? Because I don't want to leave, that's why. Is that a good enough reason for you? If you won't go with me, at least let me get a little closer. Finally, here we go. Those are her thoughts. Six steps ought to do that, mister. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. I'm not talking feet and inches, Mara. Angel, she said. My name is Angel. Have you got that? Angel, and you're wasting my time with your dust. I'm not wasting anything. She is setting very clear boundaries with him and he is ignoring them and he will continue to ignore them all throughout the book. He smiled gently. You'd be more comfortable with me in that bed, wouldn't you? He came over and sat in the chair, not the least disconcerted. I'm not saying I'm any better than any other man who comes to you. Really? I just want more. Such as? Everything. I want what you don't even know you have to give. How is that not using her? And you know, it also occurs to me right now that the main reason he isn't giving in to his desire to actually have sex with her, which is what he technically paid for, is because of purity culture. Because he believes that it's a sin to have premarital sex. It's not really about her. In my opinion, none of his actions, his desires are actually about her, but he keeps saying that they are. It's not genuine. I think that he is fully focused on himself and his own desires rather than it being a mutual, respectful relationship. He looks down on her for her profession. And his whole thing is that he wants to rescue her out of this lifestyle and make her into a completely new person. He doesn't actually ever love who she actually is. He loves what she could become if she would let him change her into that. Disgusting, disgusting. You know, and 16 year old me was like, wow, what a beautiful love story. Someone rapped twice at the door. Relief swept through Angel and she didn't bother to hide it. Smirking, she shrugged. Well, you got your half hour of talk, didn't you? She stood and walked past him. She took his hat from the hook by the door and held it out to him. Time to go. He looked disappointed, but not defeated. I'm coming back. Whatever makes you happy. Michael touched her face. Change your mind. Come with me right now. It's got to be better than this. Oh, and he will come back many, many times. And each time she will set her boundaries and tell him no, and he will ignore it because evangelical Christianity has no boundaries. Hosea did come back the next night and the next. Each time Angel saw him, her unrest grew. He talked and she felt desperation stirring. She knew better than to believe anyone about anything. Hadn't she learned the hard way? Hope was a dream and reaching for it turned her life into an unbearable nightmare. She wasn't going to get sucked in by words and promises again. She wasn't going to let a man convince her there was anything better than what she had. And here is another thread of River's misogyny. She's writing this in a way that makes Angel seem like this pouty child. That's like, I'm not gonna let a man convince me that there's anything better. You can kind of feel the implication that she does need a man. Okay, so it only takes a couple more pages for Michael to start being physically abusive. And I'm sure that Rivers would not consider this physical abuse, but it is. 
He said the same thing he always did just before he left. Come away with me, marry me. I already said no, three times. Don't you ever get the message? No, no, no. You're not happy here. I wouldn't be any happier with you. How do you know? I know. Put on something you can travel in and come with me right now. Don't think about it so much. Just do it. <laughs> for the last time, no, she said firmly and reached for the doorknob. He caught her wrist. What's keeping you here? She pulled her wrist free. I like it. She yanked the door open. Now, get out. I'll see you tomorrow, he said, and went out. So in case you didn't notice, he grabbed her wrist. That's physical abuse and it's not okay. And then on the next page, he asks God if he should do even more physical abuse to her. Standing in front of Angel's door, he tried to get control of his anger. Jesus, were you listening? What am I doing back here? I've tried, you know I have. She doesn't want what I'm offering. What am I supposed to do? Drag her out of here by the hair? He rapped twice, the sound echoing loudly down the dim corridor. She opened the door, took one brief look at him and said, oh, it's you again. Yes, it's me again. He walked in and slammed the door behind him. Her brows rose. An angry man could be unpredictable and dangerous. This one could do a lot of damage to her without much effort. Yeah, and slamming doors is an intimidation tactic. They're not even in a relationship yet. And he's already got so many domestic violence red flags. And it is tragic that her choices in this book are staying in a profession that she was forced into that she doesn't want to be in or going with this violent, abusive, controlling, misogynistic, and arrogant man. That really sucks. Those are really, really sucky choices. Does it give you a feeling of power to have me bidding for your favors every night? I don't ask you to do it. No, you don't, do you? You don't ask for anything at all. You don't need anything. You don't want anything. You don't feel anything. Why don't I just go on down the hall to that redhead's room? Isn't that it? The one you said could take me off your hands. So here he's trying to make her feel jealous. So that was it. His pride was hurt. I just wanted to see you leave town with a smile on your face. Okay, this part is so awkward. It's like evangelical Christian erotica. So just be forewarned. You want to see me smile? Say my name. What is your name? I forgot. He pulled her up off the bed. Michael. Michael Hosea. Losing himself, he cupped her face. Michael. That wasn't him saying it or her saying it. That was God saying it. Reminding him to stay pure because he's losing himself. The feel of her skin made him forget why he was there. And he kissed her. <gasps> Ooh, shame, shame. It's about time. She moved forward against him, setting him on fire. Her hands moved, and he knew if he didn't stop her, he would lose. Not just the battle, but the whole war. When she unbuttoned his shirt and slipped her hand in, he jerked back from her. <laughs> Jesus, he said. Jesus! <laughs> oh, it's so embarrassing. Can't you just picture that? Stunned, she looked up at him. Yeah, <laughs> that would be very stunning. <laughs> She's like, Jesus, <laughs> is he in here right now? <laughs> He's gonna have to pay extra. <laughs> it came to her with a shock of clear understanding. How did you manage to make it to the ripe old age of 26 without ever having been with a woman? He opened his eyes. I made a decision to wait for the right one. Can you really think I'm it? She laughed at him. You poor, ridiculous fool. She finally got to him. Jesus, I misunderstood. This can't be the one you sent for me. He could spend the rest of his life trying to make her understand. He wanted to grab her and shake her and call her all kinds of a fool. And all she did was look back at him with that smile on her face as though she had finally figured him all out. 
He was labeled and put in a bin. Labeled? Dude, you called her Mara, which means bitter. You're still calling her that. You literally gave her a fucking label and you feel labeled? And there's more examples of him wanting to enact physical violence on her and verbal abuse as well to call her names, which calling her Mara is a type of verbal abuse and emotional abuse and psychological abuse. So that's important to point out too. And remember, he's supposed to represent God because it's telling them that God is abusive and that that's love. Michael lost his temper. If that's the only way you want it, so be it. He slammed out the door and strode down the hall. He went down the stairs, straight across the casino, slapped the swinging doors out of his way and went out. He kept on walking, hoping the night air would cool him down. God, why? Tell me that. Why not a gently reared girl, untouched until her wedding night? Why not a God-fearing widow? Lord, send me a plain woman, kind and enduring, someone who would work at my side in the fields, plowing, planting, and harvesting, someone who'll get dirt beneath her fingernails but doesn't have it already in her blood, someone to give me children or someone with children already if it's not in your plan for me to have my own. Why do you tell me to marry a harlot? God says, this is the woman I have chosen for you. Michael stopped, furious. I'm no prophet, he shouted at the darkening sky. I'm not one of your saints. I'm just an ordinary man. God says, go back and get Angel. It's not going to work. You're wrong this time. God says, go back. She's good for sex, I'm sure. She'll give me that much, but nothing else. You want me to go back for that? I'm never going to get more from her than one measly half hour of her time. I go up to that room with hope and come out defeated. Where's your triumph in this? She wouldn't care if she ever saw me again. I'm just another faceless man in a long line of faceless men in her life. This can't be what you had in mind. He raised his fist. And it's sure not what I asked for. He says he doesn't want to be a faceless man in a line of faceless men in her life. How is she not a faceless woman to you? You literally just said, she's good for sex, I'm sure. <laughs> And you're asking God to give you a gently reared girl, untouched until her wedding night, a God-fearing widow, a plain woman who's going to work hard. You don't want Angel. You want a faceless woman who fits your criteria. He raked his hands through his hair. She's made it plain enough. I can have her any way I want, from the neck down, excluding the heart. I'm only a man, Lord. Do you know what she makes me feel? Then God says, Do my will, beloved. But Michael held his anger close like a shield. Nothing doing. The last thing I want or need is a woman who doesn't feel a thing. As soon as he got back to his valley and forgot all about that hell-bound girl, he would feel better. And the next time he prayed for God to send him a woman to share his life, he would be a lot more specific about the kind he wanted. So that was the first four chapters, ending with him calling her a hellbound girl. How's everyone's religious trauma doing? Is it activated like mine is? Okay. Feel free to take breaks and come back to this or turn it off if it's too much. All right, so what happens next is that Angel goes to the Duchess, who is the madam of the palace, and she asks for her gold, for what she has earned by all of the work that she's been doing. And the Duchess refuses to give it to her, and she gets mad, and she throws a teacup against the wall. So the Duchess tells this guy named, I don't really know how to say his name, McGowan, I think? He's kind of like the bodyguard of the palace. So the Duchess sends McGowan to Angel. And Angel taunts him and he beats her up really, really badly. And she basically passes out and they have to call the doctor. And 
Meanwhile, Michael has been coming back into town because he can't get Angel off of his mind and, you know, God told him to go get her. Angel roused to someone's touch. She didn't want to feel anything, ever again. But someone was there, so close she could feel the warmth of his breath. I'm going to take you home with me, the gentle voice said. You want to take her home? Fine. I'll gift wrap her, the Duchess said. But you're going to pay first. She's been nothing but trouble since the day I picked her up out of the mud in San Francisco. You can have your gold, came the voice that had pulled her from the darkness. But now it was hard, angry. Had she done something wrong again? But get out of here before I do something I'll regret. The door slammed. Pain exploded in Angel's head and she groaned. She could hear two men talking. One of them spoke to her. I want to marry you before we leave together. Marry her? She gave a whimpering laugh. I don't think she would be having a whimpering laugh. She literally, she got beaten up almost to the point of death. She like gets a fever and she has bruises all over her. I hate how Rivers writes this as if she's having all these like snide little thoughts to herself. It's like Rivers writes her as if she's like a robot, like an unfeeling robot that's just so cold and aloof that even when she gets beaten up so badly, she's still being sarcastic and snide in her mind. It's very dehumanizing. That's, that's the word I'm looking for. It's dehumanizing. I don't like it. Someone took her hand. Just say yes. She would agree to wed Satan himself if it would get her out of the palace. Why not? She managed. And that's how they get married. <laughs> um, he doesn't ask her. He also doesn't ask her while she's like conscious and can actually make an informed decision. He tells her, just say yes. And her response is not yes. <laughs> her response is, why not? And apparently that's all the consent he needs. He takes his mother's wedding ring. He puts it on her hand. They give her laudanum and <laughs> put her in this like hammock thing that they made in the back of Michael's wagon. And he drives her out of town. He basically drugs her and kidnaps her and brings her home to his house. And that is this great love story that all those people in the comments of the movie trailer are saying is the most beautiful depiction of Jesus's love, the most beautiful depiction of Christ and the church and of the love between a man and a woman. That is horrifying. And as you can see, this says over 1 million copies sold. Like, I'm sure it's much more than that by this point. It's just so sad that this book is such a good example of such common messages in evangelical Christian fundamentalism and just how damaging they are. And the rest of the book is basically grooming, you know? She's 18 and even after he gets her there to his house, she protests over and over again. She doesn't want to be married to him. What she wants is freedom. She wants to go and buy herself a little cabin on her own. She's gonna get a gun to protect herself, but she can't do that without getting what she has rightfully earned from the Duchess and the Duchess won't give it to her. I think that if Michael actually really cared about her and truly wanted to help her, maybe he would help get her set up on her own in a little cabin. I mean, wouldn't that be a very selfless and kind, decent thing to do? If he has enough gold to go visit her over and over again to pressure her into marrying him, and then he has enough gold to literally purchase her, purchase her <laughs> from the Duchess, kind of feel like he could have just used that gold to help her get out of this terrible, horrible situation and start the life that she wants. But obviously he doesn't do that. He really wears her down with his abuse and control tactics and she falls in love with her captor eventually. 
So she wakes up in his cabin and she's still super bruised and in pain. I'm glad you're feeling better, he said dryly. Pressing her lips together, she refused to eat. Her traitor's stomach growled. Feed the wolf in your belly, Mara. Then you can try fighting the one you think is at your door. Ooh, so patronizing. He really treats her like a child and not even in a kind way, like a kind parent. And then on this next page, he says that he loves her. I'm not going to hurt you, Mara, he said gently. I love you. I'm flattered, she said dryly. When he didn't say anything more, she clenched the blanket in her fist. By the way, my name isn't Mara, it's Angel. You ought to get the name right if you're going to put the ring on my finger. You said I could call you anything I wanted. Okay, sure, she said that, and now she's changing it. She's allowed to do that, and you should respect her choice. The name Mara comes from the Bible, he said. It's in the book of Ruth. And being a Bible reading man, you figured Angel is too good of a name for me. Good's got nothing to do with it. Angel isn't your real name. Angel is who I am. His face hardened. Angel was a prostitute in paradise, and she doesn't exist anymore. See what I mean? He doesn't actually love her at all. He doesn't even like her. He wants her to turn into his version of what he believes she should be. So she notices her bruises in the mirror and like her face is all covered with bruises. And she asks him, how much did you pay for me? Everything I had. She laughed weakly. Mister, you're a fool. How could he even look at her like this? There's no permanent damage. No? Well, at least I have all my teeth. That's something. I didn't marry you for your looks. Of course you didn't. You married me for my charming nature. Or did God tell you to do it? Okay, this is so awkward. This is so embarrassing. I can't believe I'm about to say this line out loud. Maybe he figured the horns in your head fit the holes in mine. <laughs> that is the weirdest Christian euphemism I've ever heard. <laughs> Angel asks, what happened to all my things? I forgot them. Besides, what you had wouldn't suit you now anyway. A farmer's wife doesn't wear satin and lace. So in addition to kidnapping her, he also is not allowing her to have any of her personal belongings another abuse and control tactic, and making decisions for her, telling her who she is, talking about her in relation to himself, not even letting her have her own identity. Does Rivers actually think that this is like charming and sweet? He tells her, in another week or two, you'll be up to taking on a few chores. Mister, I don't know the first thing about what a farm wife does. I didn't expect you would. Then just what chores did you have in mind? Cooking, washing, ironing, the garden. I just told you. You're smart, you'll learn. She decided to take another tack instead. Her mouth curved in a well-practiced smile. What about the other wifely duties? Michael glanced back at her. When it means something more to you than work, we'll consummate the marriage. So he keeps insisting that he's not going to have sex with her until she is in love with him, but she keeps trying. And I feel like it's just more evangelical Christian erotica. Angel came to her feet abruptly and stepped away. She hated his competence. She despised his calm. She wanted to destroy both. And she only had one weapon she knew how to use. She stretched sinuously, aware of his gaze upon her. My shoulders ache. Would you massage them the way you did before? He needed the tension from her muscles, increasing his own. That feels good, she said, and the sultry tone sent his pulse racing. Her hair slipped back and was like silk over his working hands. When he put one knee on the bed, she put her hand on his thigh. So that's it, he thought ruefully. She figured she couldn't build a fire in the grate, so she would build one in him instead. 
It hadn't taken her any time at all to do it. He drew back. Angel felt his retreat and followed him. She slid her arms around his waist, pressing herself against his straight back. I know I need someone to take care of me, and I'm glad you came back for me. Jesus, give me strength. Michael closed his eyes. When her hands moved, he caught her wrists and withdrew from her embrace completely. Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Hopefully it's not too bad. <clears throat> not really sure why. When he turned, Angel was ready. She knew how to act the role. She knew all the words by heart. Soft, broken words, calculated words to tear at his heart, to make him feel his rejection had hurt her. Stir guilt in with the hot blood boiling. Give him reasons and excuses to give in. That last evening in the brothel had already weakened him. He was a lamb, ready for the slaughter. <laughs> so innocent, a lamb. She pulled his head down and kissed him. Michael dug his fingers into her hair and kissed her back. She used what she knew to wage war against him. <laughs> so dramatic. He disentangled himself, gripping her shoulders. You're so relentless, he said, unwilling to surrender. <laughs> it, makes, it makes it sound like he's like the victim in this relationship when it is definitely the other way around. Honestly, she's just using a survival tactic. She's just trying to get by. She's using the only means she knows to try to gain some power back and good for her. Angel stared up at him and saw he wasn't fooled. He knew exactly what she was doing and why. She tried to pull away, but he wouldn't let her. It doesn't have to be the way you know. Let go of me, she struggled frantically. Michael saw she was hurting herself and released her. Oh, she was hurting herself? By you holding her and not letting her go as she struggled frantically? Yeah, that's how that works. Did all that make you feel any better? Yes, she hissed, lying through her teeth. God help me. She had wanted him to feel more than physical discomfort. She had wanted to annihilate him. She wanted to see him squirm like a worm on a hook. She plunked herself down in the willow chair, her neck stiff and stared straight ahead. He went outside. Does this woman have a compromising bone in her body, Lord? Or is this what I've got to look forward to for the rest of my life? Jesus, she doesn't fight fair. And then God says, she's fighting you the only way she knows how. Strangely, I agree with the voice of God right now. <laughs> okay, Angel keeps having nightmares because clearly she has PTSD. And when she wakes up once in the middle of the night, this is what happens. Michael laid his hand on her chest and her muscles tensed. If your heart beat any harder, it would come right out of your chest. Are you hoping to get my mind on something else? Michael took his hand away. There's more than sex between us. There's nothing at all. She turned her back to him. Okay, Michael stripped the quilts off her. I'll show you what else there is. So abusive, so abusive. I said, leave me alone. Raw from the nightmare, raw from being with him. She yanked the quilts back up again. Michael ripped the bed covers off. Bunching them, he tossed them on the trunk in the corner. Get up. Now, you're going whether you like it or not. Angel was frightened of him as he loomed over her. She could sense him trying to rein in his temper. Yeah, that's super concerning. And it does escalate later in the book. This is not a love story. We're going to take a little walk, he said. Now, in the middle of the night? It was cold and dark. She gasped as he scooped her up and set her on her feet. Pulling on his pants, he said, you can go dressed or naked. It's all the same to me. So she's super scared in the dark. She has no idea where he's taking her. He won't tell her. She asks him to take her back. He refuses. She almost trips and Michael caught and steadied her. Just once, try trusting me, would you? Have I done anything to harm you? Um, yes. Yes, you have. The list is very long. Trust you? Why should I? Take me back. She was trembling and couldn't stop. Not until you see what I have to show you. Even if you have to drag me? Unless you'd rather ride over my shoulder. She jerked her hand free. Go on ahead. All right, he said. 
Angel swung around to go back, but couldn't see the cabin or barn through the trees. When she turned around, she couldn't see Hosea either and panicked. Wait, she cried out, wait. Michael caught hold of her. I'm right here. He felt her shaking and drew her into his arms. I'm not going to leave you in darkness. He tipped her face up and kissed her gently. When are you going to understand I love you? Yeah, that's not loving. He purposefully scared her in order to cause her to come back to him and to be dependent on him. And I'm sure this is supposed to be some sort of metaphor for us with God. That, you know, even in the darkness, like, God never leaves us and we need to have faith and shit like that. Angel put her arms around him and pressed closer. If you love me, take me back. We can be warm and comfortable in bed. I'll do whatever you want. No, he said roughly, fighting his response to her. Come with me. So she says she's afraid because of something that happened when she was a child. And he says, I'm afraid too, Mara. Not of the dark, not of the past, but of you and what you make me feel when I touch you. You use my desire for you as a weapon. What I feel is a gift. I know what I want, but when you press yourself against me, all I can feel is your body and my need. You make me tremble. Read the room, dude. She's talking about her childhood trauma and you're just talking about being horny. Then take me back to the cabin. You don't hear me. You don't understand anything. I can't take you back. You're not going to have it your way. It's got to be my way or not at all. Michael took her hand. Now come on. And all that for the sunrise. They climb up this hill, they sit down, and as the sun comes up, Michael basically says, this is the life that I'm offering you, Mara, if you'll just stop struggling and accept it. Okay, more evangelical Christian erotica. Every night was a trial. He lay beside her and breathed in the scent of her until his head swam. She made it clear he could use her body whenever and however he wished. She looked at him every night as she took off her clothes. The question in her eyes made his mouth go dry, but he didn't give in. He waited, praying for her heart to soften. It was small satisfaction when the natural needs of his body were driving him harder the longer they were together. His mind would create pictures of them making love as it was written in Song of Solomon. He would almost feel her arms around him and taste her honeyed kisses. Then he would come out of the daydream and feel more frustrated and bereft than ever. A few pages later, he asks God, why are you doing this to me, Lord? Why did you give me this bullheaded, maddening girl? She's turning me inside out. All right, so in this next scene, they finally have sex. And I remember as I was reading this for the first time, I was kind of confused. He was so adamant over and over again, no, I'm not gonna have sex with her until she loves me back. Uh, you know, I'm gonna wait until she wants it as much as me. And then he just doesn't do that. And even as a teenager, I was like, that's confusing. Why did he do that? I thought he was waiting. But because this was written by a Christian author and my favorite Christian author, I just trusted it. And I was like, I don't know, somehow it makes sense. The mysteries of God, I guess. Michael could see her face white in the moonlight. He didn't know what she was thinking, but he knew she was tormented by the past. God, how do I save her? Angel looked up at him and saw the sheen of moisture in his eyes. Shock ran through her. Are you crying? For me? She said weakly. Don't you think you're worth it? Something inside her cracked. She writhed inside to escape the feeling, but it was there nonetheless, growing with the light touch of his hand on her shoulder and with every soft word he spoke. She was sure if she put her hands against her heart, her palms would come away covered with her own blood. Was that what this man wanted? For her to bleed for him? Oof, I'm definitely sensing a lot of Stockholm Syndrome here. Talk to me, Amanda, he whispered. Talk to me. Amanda? What's this name supposed to mean? I don't know, but it sounds like a gentle, loving name. He smiled slightly. I thought you might prefer it to Mara. He was a strange man, given to strange ways. 
Yeah, that's one way to put it. What had become of her defenses? Where was her defiance and anger, her resolve? What do you want to hear, mister? She said, anything, everything. She shook her head, nothing, ever. Michael cupped her face tenderly. Then just tell me what you're feeling right now. Pain, she said, before she thought better of it. She pushed his hands away and went back into the cabin. And now she's going to hear from Satan and then God right after. Run away from him, angel. Run away now. That was Satan. Stay, beloved. That was God. Voices warred in her head, pulling at her very soul. Michael came inside and sat down beside her on the floor. He knew she was trying to shut him out again. He wasn't going to help her succeed this time. Give your pain to me, he said. <laughs> That's very savory, very Jesus on the cross. Lord, please guide me. The fire crackled, and Angel began to relax, just listening to the soothing sounds. I wanted to die, she said. I couldn't wait, and just when I thought I had, there you were. Do you still want to die? No, but I don't know why I want to live either. The siege of emotion passed. She turned her head slightly and looked at him again. Maybe it has something to do with you. I don't know anything anymore. Joy leaped inside Michael, but only briefly. She looked hurt, not happy, confused, not certain. He wanted to touch her and was afraid if he did, she could take it the wrong way. And then God says, comfort my lamb, which means have sex with her. If I touch her now, Lord, comfort your wife. Michael took her hand, her whole arm stiffened, but he didn't let go. We're in this together, Amanda. Michael turned the gold band on her finger. She was his wife. It was time he did something about it. If she didn't know the difference between having sex and making love, he would have to show her. <laughs> this virgin is gonna show her the difference. God, <laughs> the hubris, the arrogance. <laughs> oh God, I am afraid, afraid of the depth of my physical desire. Most of all, he was afraid he would not know how to please her. Lord help. A calm settled over him, and he knew everything would be all right. Leaning over, Michael tipped her face toward him and kissed her. She didn't pull away, but she wasn't moved either. Lord, I could use a little help down here. <laughs> he shook as he combed his fingers into her hair and kissed her again. He was so tentative, Angel relaxed. She could handle this. She could handle him just fine. She could even help him along. Michael drew back. He wasn't going to allow his desire to become rampant. He wasn't going to embrace sex and lose sight of love, no matter how much more comfortable she would be with that. My way, not yours. Remember? He stood up. Angel watched him in confusion. What do you know about it? Exactly, that's what I was thinking. We'll have to wait and see. Michael looked into her eyes and saw no hardness. Neither did he see understanding. He wasn't sure which part of himself to listen to anymore. He was hard pressed by his physical nature. She was so beautiful to him. Let me help you, she said, and took his hand. Michael sat in the willow chair, his heart in his throat, as she knelt before him and pulled off his boots. He was losing control fast. Standing, he moved away from her. He unbuttoned his shirt and shrugged it off. As he undressed, Michael kept thinking about Adam in the Garden of Eden. How had he felt the first time Eve came to him? Scared half to death, yet surging with life? <laughs> I think this shows, again, kind of these evangelical loopholes. Like, I'm sure Francine Rivers knew that she was going to get criticism from fellow Christians about having, like, a sex scene in this Christian romance novel. So she was like, okay, I'll just slip some biblical stuff in there, you know, Adam and Eve. I'm gonna put Adam and Eve in the smack dab in the middle of this sex scene and um, everything will be fine. They can't argue with that, it's in the Bible. When Michael turned, his wife stood naked before the fire, waiting for him. She was breathtaking, just as Eve must have been. Michael came to her in wonder. Oh Lord, she is so perfect, like no other creation in the world, my mate. He swung her up into his arms and kissed her. As he stretched out beside her on their marriage bed, he marveled at how she fit him. 
flesh to flesh, molded for him. Oh, Jesus, he whispered, awestruck by the gift. Uh, and in case any non-Christians are watching this and don't know, he's not using that as an expletive. He's not taking the Lord's name in vain. He's literally talking to Jesus while they have sex. And that's unfortunately a very common thing in heterosexual evangelical Christian marriages. I myself have been counseled in the past uh, by Christians to invite Jesus into the bedroom with us, you know, pray before sex, pray during sex. Um, it's a little gross and weird to me now, but that is very, very common. Angel felt him, okay, this part. Angel felt him shaking violently and knew it was due to his long self-imposed celibacy. Now this part made me laugh because it just feels a little unrealistic to me now. Shaking violently, I can, I can definitely see him being shaky, you know, from nerves and the fact that it was his first time, but shaking violently, that creates quite a picture in my mind. But you know, when I was reading this as a 16 year old, like I didn't know what sex was like. I, I was like, wow, it must be so powerful. Christians love to talk about how porn gives people an unrealistic expectation. And I definitely agree with that to some extent, but they do too. <laughs> you know, that's a huge part of purity culture. Like do the right thing, stay pure, abstain from sex until marriage. And then it's going to be so powerful. Your husband is going to shake violently because of his desire for you. <laughs> it's so dorky. Strangely, she was not repulsed. Instead, she felt an alien sense of sympathy. She pushed the feelings away, blocking him out of her mind, and was surprised when he drew back from her and searched her eyes, his own filled with so much, she turned her face away. And then like Satan talks to her in her mind and tells her to think of money, think of yourself, think of being free, don't think of this man, play the part, he'll never know. But Michael wasn't like other men, and he did know. He didn't have to die to realize she had brought him to the edge of heaven and slammed the gates in his face. Beloved, he said, turning her face back to him, why won't you let me get close to you? She could feel the difference in this man right through her pores and sought to protect herself from him. God, he is powerful. She can feel him through her pores. Michael saw the flatness in her blue eyes and it broke his heart. You keep shutting me out. Tirza, stay with me. Is it Tirza now? Oh, Jesus, help me. Stop running from me. So he has a new name for her now that he made up in the middle of having sex for the first time. She says, why do you have to talk? He says, look at me, beloved. Don't. Don't what? Don't love you? Don't become part of you? I am part of you. This way, in every way. No, she said, struggling. Yes, he gentled. This can be beautiful. It doesn't mean what you've been taught. It's a blessing. Oh, my love, say my name. So this farmer wanted to know what it was really like. Well, she would show him. Don't. His rasped command confused her. Don't you want me to please you? You want to please me? Say my name. His breath mingled with hers. You said you wouldn't say no to anything I asked of you, remember? I want you to say my name, anything you said. Can't you keep your word? His calm left. Say it. Yeah, cause that's not traumatizing. You yelling at her during sex and somehow that's supposed to show her what making love is like? Okay, Michael, she ground out. He cupped her face. Look at me, say it again. Michael, was he satisfied now? She waited for his triumphant grin and instead saw his adoring eyes and heard his tender voice. Keep on saying it. Ugh, awkward. When it was over, Michael held her close, telling her how much he loved her and of the pleasure he found in her. 
He was no longer hesitant, no longer the least unsure, and with his growing assurance, her own doubts expanded. Some unknown and unwelcome emotion opened deep inside Angel. Something hard and tight began to soften and uncurl. <laughs> These sentences are very suggestive. And as it did, the dark voice arose. This is Satan. Get away from this man, Angel. You've got to get out of here. Save yourself and flee. Flee! So the next day, Michael goes out to do his chores, and Angel uses that time to leave, to go head into the town, to get her gold back from the Duchess. <clears throat> but when Michael comes back and sees that she's gone, he gets on his horse and he goes after her, and they have kind of like an argument, and he says, well, that way is the town, that way is home, it's up to you. And she ends up choosing to go back with him. Will you talk about it? Michael said. About what? Why you left? I don't know. He curled a strand of her pale hair around his finger and tugged gently. When I made you say my name, you couldn't pretend nothing was happening between us, could you? Was that it? I wanted to get inside you. Inside your heart, wink. <laughs> Just kidding. He said huskily, did I? A little. Good. He traced her face with one finger again. A woman is either a wall or a door, beloved. Well, I guess that's a different way to objectify her. She gave a bleak laugh and looked at him. Then I guess I'm a door a thousand men have walked through. No, you are a wall, a stone wall, four feet thick and a hundred feet high. I can't get over you all by myself, but I keep trying. He kissed her. I need help, Tirza. It only took a few moments for the weariness to catch up with her. She lay in the safety of Michael's arms and dreamed of a high, thick wall. He was there down below her, planting vines. As soon as they touched the soil, they grew, spreading the green life up the sides and working their strong tender tendrils between the stones. The mortar was crumbling. Michael lay in the darkness, wide awake. He would have to give up hoping he could break through her barriers. But how do I reach her, Lord? Tell me how. He closed his eyes and slept peacefully, forgetting the enemy who was loose in the world. The battle was not yet won. Dun, dun, dun. And we'll leave it there on that cliffhanger. <laughs> like I said before, please let me know if you would like me to go through the second half of the book and make a part two. As always, fuck purity culture. Fuck the messages of this book. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.